I had pretty much been bullied most of my life. And I got really fucking sick of being at school and dealing with people and knowing anyone there. All of a sudden, I went from being the weird kid at school who listened to the weird shit to being accepted in a group where, oh, okay, like we all like this weird music. We all don't really feel accepted. Like, let's just go to these parties and have fun. My brother had a show, his first show actually in SF. So I asked him, I was like, hey, can I come shoot? Because I don't know, I want to go there and have a use. I shot this show. I met Gasly that night. I met a great friend named Aaron Goldberg as well. You ever play a video game where you have to follow an NPC and you run too fast to follow them, but you walk too slow to follow oh, them yeah. either? <laughs> That's just me trying to walk with someone in general. <laughs> yeah, it's you have big strides. Well, big man, big strides, you know? <laughs> Decent sized hands, solid. Hi, this is Lauren Angelo Sidewalk Talk. Today I'm here with Nate Vogel. What's up? Wow, that's terrible. <laughs> Redo that. that <laughs> I don't, I'm so awkward in front of a camera. It's not my... Do you want to redo it? Yeah, okay. one more time. You can use that if it's funnier. I don't care. Hi, this is Lauren Angelo Sidewalk Talk. Today I'm here with Nate Vogel. Sup? <laughs> that was a reason. It's, it's even worse than the first one. <laughs> oh my god. Wait, okay, so you were born in the Bay Area. Yeah, grew up just across the Golden Gate Bridge up in Marin County. Um, pretty much spent my entire life there up until I turned 18 and then moved down to LA and tried to figure my shit out. What do your parents do? So my dad works mainly in the flooring business. My mom does business in real estate. So two things I love your parents, no fucking interest in doing, <laughs> but it allowed us, me and my brother specifically, to be supported in doing whatever we creatively wanted to do, at least for a little bit. Where do you think you and him, like, you got your creative side from? Um, that's a good question. I honestly have no idea. Because it doesn't really seem like there's a ton of people in our family who do things, not to say that they're not creative, but very business-oriented family, mm. stereotypical Jews. So, I don't know. It just... I think we were, grew up in an area where we were able to listen to a lot of different music and be able to experience different things that allowed us to open our eyes. Who knows? Yeah. So you initially started listening to metal or? Yeah, I, uh, I remember grabbing, um, probably the first couple of albums I ever listened to would, was, uh, God, I'm saying I'm a lot, huh? <laughs> now you're overthinking. People say it all the time. I say a lot of like. Well, now I'm going to start saying like a lot. <laughs> Just for you guys. <laughs> uh, I mainly started listening to Metallica and from there started to branch out more into weirder industrial metal like Marilyn Manson. Uh, Rammstein's like one of my all-time favorite bands. I remember being six or seven years old in Hebrew school with my iPod Classic <laughs> listening to German industrial metal, which was a Weird, weird, weird situation to be in. And then from there, once I got a little bit older and Hot Topic became a thing, and then you had a, all these screamo bands like Axing Alexandra bring me the Horizon Bullet for my Valentine. I was into that, and they started getting into weird black metal. And then I just started listening to Dead Mouse and Tiesto. Mm, so it was your friends who showed you Dead Mouse? I just started getting on a weird binge of listening to as much music as I could online. It was back when you could post anything on YouTube and not have it get taken down. There's no weird DMCA takedowns. You could just download any music illegally and it was super easy. So I would just click on the next video, click on the next video, click on the next video until I'd end up in these weird different subgenres that were so far away from what I listened to. But that's how I got into the house side of music and then dubstep came around and my brother and I both really fell in love with it because it's kind of the natural transition from anything rock based to electronic would be metal to dubstep. Mm. Especially when you had all these old, old, old school UK guys like Scream and Benga, Caspa, God, there's so many. Fox Pavilion, obviously. They were just all putting on this new stuff on UKF and every single time they would drop a new song, it was, it was felt metal, weirdly. Mm. It felt hard and it was this really interesting sound that felt like the right transition. 
Did you ever try producing when your brother started? I started, I think, a little bit before him, actually. I remember trying to crack FL Studio from some shitty torrent website. And I did that for a little bit. And then I started to focus on school, which was stupid because clearly I didn't need it at this point. This is in high school? This is like yeah. middle school. Oh, middle school. I think I was probably 11 or 12 when I downloaded FL Studio and tried my hand at it. And Sam was doing the same, and then I started focusing on school, and he just continued to focus on music, so it worked perfectly for him. Mm. And then, but I always felt something about music, and specifically electronic music, where I really felt this gravitation and pull towards it, that it was something interesting that I wanted to hear. Did you know that you were going to get into a creative field when you were older? Not really. I, I thought I was either going to try and start my own business, which I guess technically I did. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess I did that right. Or I, uh, I had a lot of interest in journalism and politics. Mm. And that was more where I was leaning towards, at least for a while, because I would just get worked up about what's currently happening and what was happening. So you must have been really good at school then, right? You paid so much attention in time. Yeah, I was good at school when I tried. I got honor roll when I tried. Oh, oh. I got A's when I tried, but by sophomore, junior year, I had really just kind of given up. I didn't really know what I wanted to do, and I didn't really feel like most of it was necessary. Mm. I'd only pay attention really in my journalism class because I thought it was genuinely interesting, and then history because I thought it was genuinely interesting. Yeah. And then what happened after? Um, around the time they stopped caring about school, I had pretty much been bullied most of my life and I got really fucking sick of being at school and dealing with people and knowing anyone there. And I went to a festival outside lands up in San Francisco, which is mm -hmm. all time favorite festival. And I met some people there and they introduced me to the underground rave scene. So all of a sudden I went from being the weird kid at school who listened to the weird shit to being accepted in a group where Oh, okay, like we all like this weird music. We all don't really feel accepted. Like, let's just go to these parties and have fun. Mm -hmm. Mind you, it was super sketchy and illegal. My parents don't know half the shit that I did. Oh, damn. I mean, <laughs> it was like, there was so many call, like times where I was just so, I just looked at myself and was just like, what the fuck am I doing? Where am I right now? Just ending up in like the seediest neighborhoods doing sketch shit, having a lot of fun. This was still during high school? Yeah, I was probably 15, 16 at this time. Oh my god. So you were, so this is just like stuff that you did in like your free time on the weekends, but that like kind of consumed you. Yeah, it was at first like, oh, I'd go to a show once a month and then it started to become, oh, like there's a big rave in Richmond, like the sketchiest part. Yeah, let's go on a Tuesday, fuck it just kind of sneak out of my parents' house and figure it out. I ended up stranded one too many times and I didn't have Uber or yeah. money. So I, I, I don't know, I got myself into some dumb situations, but it's all part of the fun of it, right? Were they worried for you because you didn't really have a career path in mind, your parents? I have so much love for my parents because they were really supportive and I had ideas, but not really the drive to go through with them because I don't think, I don't know. I think the ideas that I had were the ideas that people wanted me to do mm. for a lot of the time. Besides journalism, but I knew that that wasn't going to be a field that would pay me anything and I was sure fucking right about that. <laughs> and then what happened after high school? Did you, did you work like other jobs meanwhile? I mean, I was just doing stuff here and there, like helping out neighbors and babysitting and typical high school bullshit to try and get some money but um when I was 17 I had kind of gone out of the rave scene dropped most of my friend group except for a core couple of people who I'm still close with today and was just sitting there trying to figure out what the fuck I was going to do with my life and my brother had a show his first show actually in SF so I asked him I was like hey can I come shoot because I don't know, I want to go there and have a use. And he said, yeah, sure, whatever. Asked someone I knew, borrowed all their equipment, asked one of my close friends, Alex Abwanza. Shout out Alex. Oh, Amazing yeah. photographer from New York. Yeah, I should interview him soon. We've been talking. Yeah. 
Yeah, you need to get him on here if he ever comes back to LA. <laughs> yeah. Leave New York for once, buddy. <laughs> for real. <laughs> um, he wrote me like a Bible of advice. I had met him, but I was just like a raver on the front rails. He took a photo of me and that's how I became friends with him. <laughs> and he wrote me Bible of advice. I shot this show. I met Gasly that night. I met a great friend named Aaron Goldberg as well. And they were like, hey, just come to LA. We'll help you out. We'll introduce you to a bunch of people. And yeah, if you want to do it, you should do it. How many years ago was this? I was 17, so four years ago almost. And how big was your brother back then? Um, compared to now, nothing. Mm. I think he was playing, this is a Wobble Land, so San Jose Civic Center, eight or 10K cap, playing probably four slots down, so decent, but compared to what he does now, it's yeah. nothing. Yeah, so it's also, Gastu is also pretty small back then, right? Yeah, he's... Yeah. They've both blown up exponentially. Mm -hmm. And then, so before, before that, you never had any interest in like photo and video. The closest thing I had to an interest in doing anything related to photography was taking a photo class in freshman year, which I didn't really care about, but I thought, oh, this is kind of fun. And when I was younger, I used to make YouTube videos that were just stupid gaming bullshit. And I don't know, I thought, just shoot a show, do something, try something out, see what's up. When you shot that first show, did it instantly click to you or was it kind of something that took a bit of time? It was like the minute I stepped on that oh, stage, wow. I, was a, I was like jaw dropped, fucking shocked at how cool it was. <laughs> I remember how much fun I had just shooting and being there and I was, you know, I was just like another one of the photographers when you're at a festival and there's 10 too many photographers, I was that. Mm. I was the 10th too many. <laughs> but I just remember having so much fun and being so amazed, just spending all these years going to raves, you know, legal or illegal, and seeing it from the whole backstage perspective and seeing how everything actually works and how everything's thrown together. And then doing something creative in that field without actually being a DJ or an artist it was really cool to me. It instantly clicked. Mm -hmm. And then soon after you moved to LA. Yeah, so I dropped my barely existent life plans. <laughs> I had a couple of colleges I was looking at, but everything was going to be really expensive. I wasn't going to be able to afford to go without taking out massive student loans. Mm -hmm. So I just thought, fuck it. Move to LA, go to community college, save some money, try and figure it out. And I did. Yeah. Oh, so what did maybe, you study? Um, I didn't actually get that far. Oh. I was literally, I dropped out so early, I hadn't chosen a major yet. Oh. I think I got like a year and a half in just doing all of your gen ed bullshit. And I was, I think around that time I was still doing my, yeah, I had a photo job at the Yoast, rest in peace. Worst venue to shoot, but it got so fucking crazy. Mm. And I was getting paid nothing. Like, nothing, nothing. Driving myself to Orange County and back every single night, or every single Thursday for months. But I, uh, I don't know, I was just trying to find more and more work, and I realized I couldn't handle school and work. So I thought, I'm just gonna drop out. Yeah. So, you met a lot of these early people through word of mouth, right? Or just, you were driving all the way to these festivals. So I'm not even getting paid, or how was it? I did not start getting paid until last year, really. Oh, wow. I mean, I would, you know, I'd get a check every so often, or usually money under the table or a Venmo. But that's really how I met everyone, was just trying to involve myself as much in the scene and trying to go to as many shows. You know, I'm not going to say I went to Space Yacht because you're totally not allowed when you're under 21, but it's a different venue, so <laughs> totally didn't go to Space Yacht. <laughs> But I go to that or like the Yoast or the Fonda, whatever show was going on through whatever connection I had at the time, trying to meet more people, trying to get my name out there and then build out a network to try and make something of this. For the people who are watching this, what kind of, what do you say? Like, say you're meeting someone at like Fonda, like, do you just say like, I'm Nay, I like, or like, how, how do you like network? Um... 
I'm really awkward with networking. But you so. prefer, like, in person than, like, an email sending people? Oh, I... Fucking email. Oh. Emails are so required, but I hate it so much because there's no... You don't know how someone feels on the other side of that email. When you talk mm-hmm. to someone in person, if they don't like you, you can pick that up off the bat. Yeah. Over an email, you can think that someone doesn't like you, and they're actually just smiling behind the computer, like, super stoked to be talking to you, and you yeah. just can't tell. Same thing with texting, Facebook, whatever social media you want to use. It's hard to convey meaning through a computer screen. So, if I, to answer your actual question, if I was at a show, like a, at the Fonda or at a festival, whatever, you know, you're just standing around half the time and you feel awkward by just standing. So I would force myself to talk to someone because talking to someone's less awkward than talking to no one. Mm-hmm. And then just saying, hey, like, I'm Nate, what's up? How are you doing? Like, how are you enjoying the show? Blah, blah, blah. Then at some point you mention, oh, like, what do you do? Not really, like, I'm running up to you like, hey, I'm a photographer, nice to meet you, my name is Nate. <laughs> but, you know, you, you talk. Yeah. You just try and start a conversation. If it's awkward, fuck it, at least you tried. And Ooh, just yeah. try and build a connection somehow. Were you cold emailing people, too? Yeah. Like artists, like, looking I, at their bios. I was really bad at that, but I did it. I think everyone has to. It's just cold calling, especially for local festivals or something that you can go out to. You have to just try and push yourself out there in any way possible. Because if you don't, well, there's 10 other people behind you who are going to try and do the same. Mm. And then how did you meet the people you worked with, like Joyride, Slender? So it really all came together for me. November 2016, up in Sacramento, it was the Safe and Sound tour. And Joyride was a special guest for that date. And then Snails, I believe, was on the entire tour. And I was shooting the local, local opener. I think the doors were at 7, they were on at 7. And someone I had met in the past had texted me being like, you're at the show, I need a photographer for Joyride. I said, cool. I'm assuming I'm not getting paid, right? They're like, fucking of course you're not. (laughs) So I took it anyways and did the show. And right after Joyride went off, it was Snails next, and I had met him a year prior at Red Rocks. Mm -hmm. I didn't think he'd remember me, and he immediately runs up to me. He's like, yo, dude, what's up? Like, how the fuck are you? I haven't seen you in forever. And we started talking, and we were talking about New Year's after his set. And I pushed him into a corner into trying to get a show booked together. Mm -hmm. So that was, like, where everything started was I shot Joyride. He loved the work, and that's how I started getting more offers with him. And then Snails, love you, Fred, but I was super fucking annoying to him and just start blasting him on, like, Facebook and everything, trying to get this one show booked. Then we did that, and then we did a few more shows after that, and then his management team reached out, and all of a sudden I had 20 dates for the summer flyouts. Wow. Yeah, and I wasn't making any money before that. (laughs) I had gone to Arizona. That's the furthest I had gone, or Denver, I guess furthest I'd ever gone away from LA for work and all of a sudden I had my first show was in two weeks going literally across the country to DC like, <laughs> fuck yeah this is really cool <laughs> let's keep this rolling so how did you go from like not getting paid to getting paid where you're like okay I'm not like I'm not doing this for free anymore uh, it's a really hard transition to make because it, it, you have to stand your ground at some point Yeah. And especially when you're new and you don't really have connections, you don't know who to ask. Like, what the fuck do I charge? Mm -hmm. What's a realistic rate? What's, what am I supposed to do? Joe Larkin, actually, who I know that you, you had him on here before, right? Yeah. Yeah. Joe Larkin was my guy. He had uh, been the person who I would constantly go to for advice. So at least I had someone to guide me. Without him, I would have been fucked. He, um... He told me once I started getting tour dates, it's like, you have to do this for money. You can't go on tour for free. And he forced me to push the teams I was working with to ask for more. And to try and actually, you know, get a paycheck that I could live off of. Mm. Which is hard. Yeah. It's really hard. (laughs) And then what happened after? Like, how did you meet the rest of the people that you worked with? Once you... I think that there's a few things that anyone who works anything in relation to an artist whether it's like 
tour manager, production, like backline, photographer, videographer, whatever you do, I think that there's a few things that people will notice if they see you do it. If you go on tour, if you do a bus tour and then you go international, I think, I could be wrong, but I think that those three things are so important to show other people that you're capable of doing whatever is brought to you. Mm. Because the minute I started going on tour with Fred and the minute I started going on tour with Johnny, all of a sudden, I started popping up and emails started showing up. Oh, wow. Because, okay, someone else tested them and they can do it. Let's bring them on. Because mm-hmm. you never know how someone will handle touring. Yeah. You really don't. I, just, I didn't think I'd be able to handle it either. <laughs> and at the same time, were you just watching tutorials of editing and coloring? Yeah, it was just a combination of YouTube and then stealing as many Visco presets from torrent websites that I could <laughs> and trying to reverse engineer them and figure out how the fuck any of it worked out. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, I like want to say, oh, like, I went to this workshop or I did this one thing. It's not, it's, it's time. It's watching a bunch of videos. It's asking around. It's mm-hmm. downloading a bunch of illegal fucking presets. Yeah. And then trying to reverse engineer and recreate the things that you like and emulate the things that you like until you can make it into your own style. Mm -hmm. At that point, did you have any, or still now, uh, videographers, photographers that you look up to? Or you like their style? Oh, yeah. Um, God, there's a lot of people who I really like and respect and look up to. I mean, I think one of the top guys, no matter what, is James Winterhalter. He's Mm -hmm. just, his mind and how he works and how he creates edits is just far and beyond electronic music. It's art. It's, I think, some of the truest art I've seen created in our own industry. So there's a lot of respect to him. Um, Joe Larkin, of course, for always helping me out. And I mean, he was the guy who I was, I was like a little kid asking him questions and he was like, my dad, like, it's okay, son, like, I got you. (laughs) Um, A new name for sure, David Veltri, he's done... 1788L, Gasly, and a few other people based out of Denver. I met him at a show out in Denver, and he was making dumb meme videos. That, mind you, are fucking hysterical. <laughs> but me and a couple of friends pushed him to start making, you know, real video edits and real content, and he's fucking killing it. The things that I see him do where I'm like, I don't, how did you even do this? Mm-hmm. He's newer to it than I am, and... I'm like mind blown by some of his work. (laughs) So what is it actually like being a touring photographer, videographer? It is the best worst thing of your fucking life. There's so many amazing experiences that I would never have had. And getting to visit all these beautiful countries, meet so many people that are just genuinely good people that you would never ever give opportunity to meet. And seeing just so much, it's it's fucking amazing. It's so cool, right? Mm-hmm. You get to go to all these festivals and all these shows. You meet all these promoters, all the people who you work with, your fucking peers. It's amazing. I really, really do love it. But the one thing about touring is it's really bad for you in every single way at the same time. It's destructive to your mental health, really bad for your physical health and destroys a lot of relationships. I mean, most of my friends who I still have around are the ones who get it. Most people don't. In what way does it like, uh, like cause like problems for like mental health and how do you, and why does it distance you from friends? Well, it's really hard to stay close to people when you get an opportunity to see them once every four months and half the time you're in a time zone that's anywhere from 8 to 20 hours different than them. Mm. And it's the same thing with your family, too. It's like, oops, I'll, like, go ghost on my parents just because I don't have the ability to even send a fucking text back because I'm just so drained. It's just living on your own in airports, in hotels, in transports, in green rooms. There's no sense of normalcy to it. It's... As humans, I don't think that anything about how touring works is supposed to be normal. Mm. But you're also surrounded by people, though, right? Or is that also a difficulty to, like, constantly be surrounded by people? It's... When it comes to, like, your touring party, the people who I work with, I work with because... It's not just that I love their music and that I love their vision. It's because 
they treat me right and I treat them right. The people that you tour with are your family, even more so than your literal family. Mm -hmm. Those are the people that you'll spend all of your life with when you're on the road. I mean, the artists who I work with, I see way more than I see, I'd say my parents, my close family, and my close friends. Yeah. I see those people maybe 1% of the time that I get to see the people I tour with. The people I tour with, I'm with every fucking weekend, no matter what. Yeah. My family, I only get to see them when I can. It sucks. Mm -hmm. It's like you miss, you miss birthdays, you miss funerals, you miss weddings, you miss everything. And there's nothing you can really do about it unless you want to stop touring. But I don't, I don't see that as an option. Mm -hmm. What's your goal for the future? Like, do you still see yourself doing this in the next few years? I definitely want to keep on touring for at least another few years. Maybe try out some different genres and different parts of the music business. And then from there, plans are secret because I have things that are coming that I don't <laughs> want to say on a video. Have someone be like, that's a great idea. I'm just going to do that before him. <laughs> but I have plans. But for now, in the short term, tour for at least another three to five years. I mean, I'm young. I'm only 21. So I can still do this without my body being completely destroyed. You know, there's guys who I tour with who are like, they're in their like mid to late 30s and it's just like, fuck. Wow. Like, I don't know how you are built like Iron Man to be able to handle the fucking stress and destroying of your body that goes with touring. But I just want to say as a point, all this negative shit about touring doesn't mean that touring is bad. I still think it's one of the best things you can ever do in your life. Everything that I've done in the past three years, I've never thought would be my life, would be real. And forever, I feel fucking blessed. I live in Los Angeles with a really great friend of mine. I get to tour around the world with people who I consider my family. I, I get to do what I love. Yeah. Most of my <laughs> friends don't get to say that. At least the ones who don't get to work in music. Mm, yeah. So it's, it's all worth it in the end. It's just, you gotta decide not even that you gotta say, you just gotta understand it's not easy. It's amazing, but it's not easy. Yeah. What equipment do you use? Wow. So emotional of a question. <laughs> I went from there. <laughs> so like... <laughs> my equipment. <laughs> um, oh my god. Most touring weekends, I'll have my 5D Mark III, a 60 as a backup, my... 8 to 15, my 16 to 35, my 24 to 70, then my Yasuka T4, a Polaroid, sometimes my Sony RX100, and then my laptop, obviously, my Nintendo Switch, the most important piece of gear you could ever own on tour, <laughs> and then a million chargers and batteries. Yeah. Pretty much, I have enough that if I ever get my bag weighed, this happened to me in Mexico, they tried to check my camera bag because it was, I think... 15 pounds over the carry-on limit. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I had to check in my bag, or they tried to make me check in my bag. I think That's I had to scary. pay like a hundred bucks for that. Damn, I don't trust that. <laughs> yeah, I know. That was, and mind you, I had, it was my second time being in Mexico and I had spent like 10 hours already on that trip, just being in airports and flying. And then I had to fly back from Mexico City to LA, which is I think six hours. So I just didn't really want to deal with it. So I just paid the fee or whatever, but yeah. you know, <laughs> fuck, I'm just so mad. <laughs> yeah, let's turn it back. Cool. Oh, I can you sit on this side? Huh? Okay. Um, oh, yeah, no, I wasn't going to switch sides on you. Oh yeah, some people don't like It's like no. a super weird continuity error. Yeah, exactly. Like, hey guys. <laughs> Well, what I'm talking about today is I watched jump cut. That. <laughs> the switch arms. <laughs> yeah, and then you're just running over here fucking yeah. throwing it side to side. Like, <laughs> no, no, I got you. How would you say you've grown as a person compared to when you were younger? Um, how was I, how am I as a person now compared to when I was younger? Mm -hmm. That's actually a really good question. I mean, I guess when I was younger, I was this really shy, introverted, nerdy kid who was just really used to just getting shit thrown at me and having to just put up with it. 
I think especially with everything that I've been doing, it really made me grow as a person, just become more confident, more able to stand up for myself, just stronger of a person in general, and a lot more creative. Just doing all of this, getting to live in a new place, getting to see all these different places. You. I don't know, it's hard to find that kind of creativity when you're locked down in one place. And whether that's a physical place or a mental place, it's really hard to branch out of that. So doing what I do now, I get to feel so much more creative and so much more inspired by the things and the people around me. Yeah. Last question, what do you want to be remembered for? You know, I watched your interviews and was sitting there thinking, how do I answer this fucking question? Yeah, did you prepare? <laughs> no, I didn't, of course I didn't. <laughs> Good. I sat there and thought about it, just went, I don't fucking know. I don't. <laughs> like it's such a long time ahead of me where maybe the thing I want to be remembered for now isn't the thing I want to be remembered for, you know, when my time's up. Mm -hmm. You never know with life, you know, your time could be up whenever, but so I would be remembered as someone who pursued what they wanted to do and tried their best to be there for those friends and family and was overall not a total asshole. <laughs> wow, what a fucking answer. This is the last interview I ever do in my life and that's the fucking, that's the headline asshole. right there. I don't want to be an asshole. Smart guy up here. Oh, oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs>